This on conference the will now be recorded. The Red Chris Underground uh, Block Cave project um, and our transition from open pit mining to the potential block cave mining in the future. Um, I guess just in way of introduction, been in the industry over 25 years and started Ontario, spent my time between um, um, you know, northern Ontario into central and eastern Australia, BC, and um, I guess in the last 12 years, I spent most of my time in block caving, helping to build new Afton in Kamloops, um, uh, as underground mining manager at North Parks in Australia, and now working with uh, Newcrest in helping to build the, the next block cave for Canada at Red Chris. Right, I'm going to jump into our, our, our normal slides, which you'll recognize um, anyone who's given a presentation of any size or importance. Don't depend upon what I'm going to say. A lot of it's forward looking. Um, there is a, a lot of information here. Most of it's already in the public um, domain. Um, I'm just stringing it together differently. Um, and our, our best source of information is on our website um, in our investor uh, section of the Newcrest website. We report and we're listed in both Australia and Canada exchanges, so we report to JORC and the 43101 requirements. The other thing I want to make sure that um, everyone realizes is that our project, the Red Chris project, is located entirely on Taltan territory. Um, the, it's in close proximity to Iskit, to the community of Iskit in Northern British Columbia in the Golden Triangle. We value our partnership with the Taltan. It is a partnership. And um, the, the, the Iskit band, Taltan band, and the Taltan central government, which are the signatories to, the, um, to, to our impact benefit and co-management agreement um, between Red Chris and, and Taltan. And they have done a fantastic job as stick as 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 looking after the stewardship of this land since time immemorial. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background first on Newcrest, who we are, um, what we're about. Then I want to dive into a little bit of specifics about the project, about the block cave the mining method, the uh, applicability to Red Chris. Um, then I have a little bit of information about our exploration program and a, and a bit of a, a look ahead and what's next for Newcrest in Canada. And that's where we'll talk about um, things like Predium. So first of all, who we are, and I, I just want to always, the, the people make things happen. And these are the people or a small subset of the people that are making things happen right now at Red Chris at the site. The Nagad decline was established and started on June 25th, 2021. Um, that's our, our exploration decline and at first entrance into the underground um, for Red Chris. Obviously, you can see the jumbo and the, and the new sign that is now hung above the entrance to our decline. But this is our, our, our team at site. And specifically here, we don't have just the underground team shown, but the team on site that supports and is currently mining the open pit to generate money that, that, that run our uh, warehouses, uh, run the administration look after our stakeholders across the board. Newcrest. Um, Newcrest is a large mining company uh, when it comes to gold mining in Canada and, and around the globe um, primarily. In Canada now we're looking at uh, what is the, an, an asset, an operating asset in Red Chris for the open pit having um, been running since 2015 and, and in a joint venture with Imperial Metals um, since Newcrest took it on in uh, August 2019. Our assets, and you can see the clump to the bottom right there, primarily around Australia, Asia, um, and our operating assets um, in, in Cadia. Um, it's probably our, our largest crown, crown asset that, that makes the bulk of our revenues. Um, Lahir and Telfer um, following behind. Haveron is a project under development, as is Red Chris uh, Underground. Like I said, Red Chris is a current open pit. Um, it's about 80 kilometers um, south of Dees Lake, beside the town of Biscuit. Um, the, 
other piece of property that's nearby that we're also active in is the uh, the JG or GJ property. Sorry, it's about 30 kilometers west across the highway from the Red Crisp Mine. And our exploration program there is slated to start this year, this calendar year. You said we are in a joint venture with Imperial Metals. It's 70% uh, and operatorship is with Newcrest, the Red Crisp and GJ. We aren't just a mining company. We consider how um, our impact on, on the environment and on um, how, it's, I guess, our communities around us um, is, is to be carried out. And as we aspire to be an industry leader, an industry leader, um, we're not just, uh, I guess, talking about this, but I'll go through some slides that show how we're implementing this already uh, in the short time that, that Newcrest has been a player in Northern BC. The, I guess the value basis that, 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 that gives the strength to Newcrest is what I want to make sure um, uh, comes across. We're a value-based company, um, and, and this is just one subset, one piece of our values around sustainability. So it's not only environmental responsibility, it's about our communities, it's about everyone in our workforce, and it is about overall making sure uh, we act with integrity and ethically. Again, as we talk about health and safety, um, we know that uh, this is about our people um, and the importance of, of everyone going home safe. The, um, the, the key aspects to that that are Red Crest operation, and these come and are across the New Crest Corporation, uh, include the New Safe Program, um, that is a behavior-based safety management program. It's not about the rules as it is about um, making sure that um, we own our environment and own the risks around us and address them as such. As, as a company, we are strong in risk management. Um, that is the risk assessment process, including the measures to manage those risks once they're evaluated um, and the tracking and critical controls management to make sure that we can continue to have uh, consistent uh, controls in place to manage those risks once they're identified and managed. Our respective work program is a relatively new um, launch program. And this is recognizing the importance um, that as we have a more and more diverse and inclusive work program or, or, or workforce, um, everyone should feel comfortable, safe, and respected at, at work. And so um, this program is focused on the uh, elements to make that happen. And as we look at the, the basis here, that the, the, the key pillars at the bottom, I talked a little bit about it, our culture and, and values-based culture, um, and that's through our new SAFE program, critical controls management I spoke to, which addresses and fits in with uh, those risks once they're identified, and our process safety management, which is building um, and designing so that things um, fail safely. So it's been a two-year journey at Red Crest, and over that time, Newcrest has seen a 45% reduction in health and safety incidents on site. We're very proud to have made that shift, made that change, and we're looking to this, looking for this to continue. Earlier on, I was talking about sustainability and the environmental aspect of that, and this is a bit more um, about that. We, we have a commitment, a publicly disclosed and um, actively being pursued commitment in GHG reductions, 30% uh, by 2030, and we're judging ourselves against uh, the 2018 baseline. And we've also set the goal of net zero carbon emissions. So that's another reason or, or a reason um, that makes Red Crest an important part of the new Crest portfolio as well. We have in the block caving mining method um, and, and the, the, the location in Northern BC, the opportunity to not just create the most productive underground mine in Canada in terms of tons per day or tons per year, but also one of the cleanest. The block cave mining method lends itself to, to, to electrified fleet um, for production on the footprint. 
It's one location. We'll be mining from that location for um, up to 30 years. We're located right adjacent to and we're drawing power from the Northwest Transmission Line, um, which draws from BC Hydro's uh, grid power. This is a, you know, an advantage in um, the GHG pursuit in that there's uh, obviously the majority of that power is hydro generated. The installation and, 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 and upgrades of electrical power distribution and, and, and pumps on our site, um, we are always moving forward um, to increase uh, the efficiency and implement electrical options where possible. And our innovation challenge focus um, uh, at, with the MABC um, uh, Mining Association of British Columbia and our water reduction, um, uh, use reduction in, in focus in mining is um, a spot, key sponsorship of ours, um, key to our site, managing water and um, increasing our use of renewable energy are the keys to unlocking the, uh, the net zero carbon emissions. We can't go past and, and talk about our communities and our social performance and, and uh, programs in this area. Um, we are always looking for the best outcome. And like we talked about partnerships with, uh, with our Taltan um, um, uh, hosts and, and our partners in, in the Taltan community. We have our local communities, which are primarily Taltan, um, uh, I guess, uh, primarily people from the Taltan community living there. And we have um, their views and interests and concerns at heart because they are our interests, views and concerns. Um, we're a neighbor, um, not, uh, not a separate place. So up, to, up till now, just over the last two years, we've progressed in a pathway here of updating and implementing uh, a new version of the Impact Benefit Co-Management Agreements. This is the IBCA, as we call it. You notice the use of the word co-management in the title. Um, that's very real difference from what would be an IBA normally. We have established a social performance team to carry this out. It's, it's something that um, started small and has now got a, a sizable footprint and, and a real meaningful footprint in the communities. Um, and that's been during the, the time of COVID um, and the difficulties in, in having person-to-person -person connections. We have completed a, a land use study led by Taltan um, interests. We are currently undertaking a social baseline study um, with a collaboration with Taltan and with other mines to, to determine our impact um, in the future as we expand and, and move into underground mining. Established a shared committee that deals with social cultural issues uh, with Taltan and, and Newcrest and leveraged the uh, uh, community su support fund, um, which first came up and became part of our, our work during the pandemic, but um, has, uh, I think, got enough hold now. It may continue, but we have, we have I guess, together spent over $800,000 with Taltan on initiatives that uh, have made a great difference. Um, and we're talking about um, things that have increased people's mobility, provided, um, logistics when um, things were not available, like roads were closed um, and, and provided health services um, when that was needed. Talked about respect at work and diversity inclusion. Um, and we are very aware that this is the future for all of us. And we're moving forward quite quickly in, in developing and, and maintaining inclusive culture. Um, we value people's differences um, and abilities that come with that. We feel that that, that diversity brings us better decision-making, better outcomes, and, and better results. A few key metrics along the bottom there. Um, the, the sitting around 20% of both, both female and um, Taltem representation in our employees as we look at um, our, our contract base and the number of Taltan um, Nation um, employees in our contractors, we know that 20% is, is, is a vast understatement, especially in the summer as our earthworks and uh, um, activities that relate to, uh, to earthworks uh, ramp up. Next, I'll go into the blockade itself. Um, there's a bit of a, 
Um, it's a bit hard in person or without being in person, but um, in, in any uh, group gathering, there's, there's always a need, I think, to, to set a level of, um, I guess, common understanding around what blockading is. To do that, I'm going to set up and play a video here, and it um, will include sound. So, um, Bayer, I depend on you to tell me if, if the sound doesn't come through. Um, as you can see, this has been prepared and and shared uh, with the permission of Epiroc, um, but it does give a great representation of what a, a generic uh, block cave mine looks like. Block caving is a large scale mining method. I just want to check, did the sound come through there? Sounds good. Okay. That allows for huge volumes of rock to be extracted efficiently. However, the development time before production starts is longer compared to other mining methods. By drawing rock from the extraction level in the lower part of the mine, a gap is created. Absence of support for the overlying rock mass, together with rock stress and gravity, will cause the rock mass to cave. This minimizes drilling and blasting of ore, but require the ore body to be large enough and the rock conditions to be favorable for natural breakage. To draw the first pieces of rock, to create this gap, the rock mass in the lower part of the ore body needs to be broken down into smaller pieces. To achieve this, an undercut level is developed and blasted. Below, an extraction level is developed where ore will be extracted throughout the life of that production area. Draw bells are created between undercut and extraction levels and become passages for caved rock. To avoid misfires, accurate drilling is crucial. Substantial rock reinforcement, such as steel arches, sprayed concrete, cable bolts, rock bolts, steel mesh and straps are usually required due to several factors associated with block caving, including extreme rock stress changes and a long production period. Rock is loaded from the draw points and can be dumped into ore passes connected to a haulage level or directly into a crusher. A variety of transportation methods can be employed for transporting ore to surface. The fragmentation of the ore and the crushing requirements are key factors influencing the choice of a method. The extraction of ore will sooner or later cause the surrounding rock to cave resulting in subsidence on the surface. Provided the rock breaks successfully and the ore can be extracted evenly at desired draw points, block caving is a high productivity method with low operating cost that allows a high degree of mechanization and capability of automation. I think we're holding up uh, questions till the end, but um, I'll just, I guess, point out a, a few key things that are uh, an important part of the uh, the message here, and that is that it takes a long time for us to get developed to the bottom. Um, it, it takes a while, and uh, it takes years, in fact, to to set up for. But all of that capital investment up front results in quite a low operating cost once we're up in mining um, and as we progress um, our block cave is located underneath an existing open pit and our subsidence zone will um, because of that start and, and be initialized inside of that open pit itself 
and capability of automation. Moving to the next slide, then you can see the next slide. Yeah, good. So how does this fit into the big picture and our uh, some of our larger goals? You know, the um, I'll first talk about the greenhouse gas uh, and, and carbon impacts of this mining method. Um, we have the ability here to access this 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 ore body. It it proceeds from surface nearly vertical down to about 1.2 kilometers. We are able to do that solely because of this mining method. Um, this ore body is not amenable to mining by any other method um, that we know of today. It provides a long life asset in terms of right now uh, we're looking at 30 31 years in the block cave alone plus the remaining life in the open pit um, it creates during that time of course all the benefits opportunities and uh, um, um, and contracting work that is required to build it over the next seven to eight years and to run it for the remainder of that time block caving improves the project economics for the red chris operation um, tremendously it, it also has a, a benefit of having a reduced waste rock footprint on surface. If we were to attempt to mine this using a, an open pit method, the waste rock required to be relocated and managed over time would be many times more than what would be the small amount required for the development of the block cave. And as we look at block caving as a mining method, it already is a low energy use mining method. And as we include electrification, and the fact that our um, impacts outside the gate in terms of who generates our electricity and it being from hydroelectricity, we have a, a, a huge benefit in having a reduced carbon footprint. And on the right, in case anyone needs a reminder, um, copper is the fuel for the upcoming, um, um, I guess, battle against the, uh, the climate change and the changes that we need to make to a, a low carbon future. Um, if you look at the red line and demand um, based on what we think we can do um, and look at the AET2 demand based on what we think we should or we ac actually need to be able to do, um, there's a gap there and um, um, we will be producing copper um, as our primary value generator from Red Chris, although it is a gold mine. Um, so it's a, uh, an opportunity to create copper at the lowest energy, lowest carbon footprint that you can imagine. So where are we right now? Um, I mentioned earlier that our, our exploration decline commenced in June. Um, it is still going forward. We have reached um, a decline advance. So this is the, the main face, the critical path face of the main decline advanced 765 meters as of the end of January or near the end of January here. Um, the pre-feasibility study has been released, um, and as you can, I guess, guess and, and surmise from those things, we are progressing with the study while we are progressing with the exploration decline. Our feasibility study is underway now and is expected to be completed in the second half of financial year 23. So for those of you that are thinking in calendar years, that's in the first half of calendar year 2023. Our permitting activities are ongoing um, and a partnership with uh, with Taltan um, and their, their unfortunately named Committee Threat um, and the EOC and the BC regulator and, and Taltan working together. We are targeting our first production of gold and copper in financial year 27. I've got some statistics here from the PFS. I'm sure for the interest level uh, and the 40 people on the call today, you've all probably read it in detail, but I'll just cut to the chase here and give you the highlights just in case you haven't or you don't remember all the details. So it's a healthy project, the IRR at 17%. And if we looked at um, you know, more, I guess some more higher consensus gold and copper prices, we'd be at 22% IRR. Um, that's not to be sneezed at. This is not a, uh, an aggressive, program of work or an aggressive uh, study. This is a conservative study based on a, a pure and, and an internal requirements for a PFS. Payback period is three years after we start production. Our NPV is 2.876 billion at the higher prices. 
the study assumption is 1.8 billion. The life of mine, underground only, is 31 years. It will cost us $2.1 billion to build it over a period of time. We'll produce at an ASIC or all in sustaining cost of minus $144 per ounce after copper credits. So this is, um, I guess, a result of the work done so far in, 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 in the study, um, progressing from concept to PFS. Um, it builds on Newcrest's experience and uh, leverages that uh, knowledge from elsewhere within Newcrest and specifically Cadia and uh, the Telfer operations. Um, the recently completed projects as well within Newcrest. Um, this is a tier one asset within a tier one jurisdiction um, in our portfolio. Um, and we do believe and we do know um, that we're going to have uh, uh, further optimization underway as we assess near mine opportunities, including East Ridge, which I'll, I'll show you on the next slides. A little bit more about the footprint, the underground um, uh, mining location for that 31 year mine life. We will start with the yellow block, macro block one, and all of the infrastructure in the top right hand corner. That's our initial target and, and um, our initial point of start of production. The plant and upgrade on surface to match the production rate from underground will be completed as well during the same time that we're building concurrent with the underground build and we'll be reaching uh, the 13.6 million tons per annum according to the study work done so far. Uh, we have some work to do to the mill, SAG, single stage SAG uh, line to add in parallel to our current line and of course expanded uh, flotation and dewatering circuits at the back end of the mill uh, as so our, um, our, our grade increases and our hardness increases. So we have to uh, have more combination power and, um, and more dewatering capacity. We have, and we do have an option for 15 million tons per annum that was brought to PFS level as well. Um, we do know how that would work. Um, and we're looking at that as upside op op optionality. And um, as we go forward, our feasibility study will and is already looking at electrification of the underground fleet. Um, and the use of automated equipment where uh, it makes sense to do so. Um, and we've done that, um, it's been done in other block caves around the world. So as we look at macro block one and then progressing to macro block two and then adding macro block three, um, you can see we stay with one main crusher in the top um, right there, northeast corner of this uh, layout and then the blue truck haulage loop that then trucks um, over the longer term back to that same crusher. From there, it's a, it's a, 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 a conveyor to surface. Um, from there to a, a new uh, um, stockpile beside the mill and a new uh, location that feeds into the new SAG, a single stage SAG at the mill. Stepping back again now and say, all right, what else is there around, around, around Red Chris? This is a isometric view basically of our open pit, current operating open pit. Um, you can see the hotter grades located underneath the east zone um, and underneath the east pit there. And that is the focus of our, um, uh, our current block cave PFS study is that uh, that section underneath in the east zone here. I don't know if you could see my mouse. The east ridge is this exciting um, new uh, information that's coming from the exploration team located outside of our mineral resource. Um, and this has the potential to increase our, our resource base, the, the volume which and the, the quantity of our resources. Um, this is a long train or along the uh, extent of our porphyry corridor. That's extended over 800 meters to the east. Um, and um, we don't know you have, I guess, what is um, similar grade uh, material, but also you can see it's going a little bit deeper um, as we go east there to the right. So this provides us some information and, and, a, and a potential pipeline of, uh, this is quite early stage, this is an exploration target at this point, 
um, which could um, be incorporated into our mining plans in the future. And if you know our experience at Katy is anything to go by, we know that these um, these ore bodies and, and porphyries um, don't don't hang out alone. They're, they usually come in groups. Um, and this um, the way these hold together is that they can they allow us to unlock further optionality. Last point here is is um, I guess to highlight that we are looking at potential of early mining within our current block cave footprint. Um, there are some higher grade pods located within the east zone, and that um, mine plan is also happening in parallel now. Right, well, what's next? Because Red Chris isn't the only thing that Newcrest is up to. We did some early Christmas shopping and expanded our footprint in, in British Columbia and in the Golden Triangle in Northern BC. There is a, uh, an agreement in place to complete uh, the transaction to, to take on ownership of Predium and the Bruce Jack Mine. Um, of course, that's not yet completed, but th that has uh, been announced and uh, progressed quite far and still to be finalized. Why is that such a good fit? Um, anyone who knows Predium knows it has a good, um, already a tier one, large scale, long life, high grade, low cost producing mine. Um, adding that to our portfolio in a tier one jurisdiction here in the Golden Triangle, right beside our next um, large operation in, in the underground at, at Red Chris makes a lot of sense in terms of synergies um, and uh, provides a shift in the center of gravity for Newcrest as a company. This immediately increases our gold production by 300,000 ounces to, to well over 2 million per year. Um, this is obviously accretive to our cash flow um, and provides uh, an operational and fi financial diversification within the North American and Canadian primarily uh, jurisdiction. Grows where we already are. Um, and it provides, again, near mine and district scale exploration opportunities that we're looking forward to exploring and, 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 and finding out more about. And in the end here, even as we proceed with uh, uh, transactions of this size, we retain, a, we retain a strong balance sheet to fund our projects, um, our uh, additional purchases perhaps, but certainly to fund our, our, our global organic growth portfolio that's been talked about in the uh, uh, in the public space already. So we are looking to invest and grow in the region, in Northwest British Columbia, in British Columbia, in Canada, and in North America. We plan to invest and share benefits with our surrounding communities. That's how we see us leveraging our existing relationships to make sure we have uh, the best um, foot forward as it goes to, to managing not just Red Chris, but also Predium and, and Bruce Jack, primarily Bruce Jack operation. Because there are, you know, it's, uh, we're expanding uh, the number of, of, of relationships we do build um, as we move to, to Bruce Jack. There are other First Nations um, to be engaged and in, in, in whose land we will be operating on. We are sustaining Canadian jobs. Um, you know, obviously the deposits are here, the mining happens here. Um, and the work gets done here, um, and we're um, bringing advancement opportunities for our workforce across, um, no matter where they are from um, or what their background. So, um, you know, a person who's grown up here could find themselves in Australia if, if, if they were to join Newcrest. Someone who's in Australia could find themselves transferring across to here, to Canada. As part of this change and in, in growth, we are um, we have a regional off we have an office in Vancouver. It will turn into a regional office that we will maintain, um, including a, a chief operating officer and a, a section of our executive located in Vancouver. And of course, uh, we will continue with our priorities. And as you saw earlier in the slide pack, um, that includes our environmental sustainability commitments. Now, don't turn away yet. This is there's there's places to learn more. I talked about our website. 
our investor section of our website, and all importantly, the endnotes. Um, in here, there's uh, buried some gems. I just pulled out a few. Our discount factor is four and a half. Um, we have uh, our production. Commercial production is 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 uh, described as re reaching critical hydraulic radius for the Red Chris Block Cave, um, and uh, there's obviously links to our other uh, um, disclosures that have been made. So uh, don't go past these slides. They're uh, uh, may not be as interesting, but there's some little gems in there. All right, and that's me. I think I've just about hit my time mark. Uh, there is there. Maybe open it up for any questions. There was there was great presentation. Thank you, Eric. If there is any questions, uh, please uh, ask away. Could probably write it into you in the chat as well. Hi, Eric. It's uh, Ben Sharp. Good to see you today. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. This may be a uh, humorous, sensitive question, but uh, do you see moving any executive level uh, new crest positions to uh, Canada? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, our COO has started already. Our, our chief operating officer, um, as start Craig Jones, has started already his his new role in Vancouver and working from the office there. Um, so that is one for sure. And um, you know we will be building a support uh, team around that role. And and yeah, a section of the executive will be located in Vancouver. Um, and it's been described by our CEO as a a movement in the center of gravity because Melbourne has been the center of, of Newcrest um, and that center of gravity is now shifting um, and, and that's what that means is, is part of the executive will be here. Well we have a we have a lot of uh, Australians and others uh, in our organization and there's a friendly rivalry as to which which country is the most uh, important in the global mining world so thank good to hear that. Yeah, I don't think you want to get me started on that. The, uh, uh, it might take a little bit more than a few beers to get through that discussion. But um, what I will say is that we're intent on bringing the best of the world to Red Chris. Um, you know, there are great miners in a lot of different continents. Um, and our, our company has expertise centered around Australia um, and Australasia. But we will bring the best of the world from wherever it needs to come from. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric. There's a qu question from Matthew Brown. Is the mine expecting much seismic activity? Are the risks already known and being mitigated? Yes. No, it's a, uh, it's a good question. We have, um, we, the, the project's located in a low seismic activity, so there's a rating um, for the region that has us on the very low end of the scale. Now, um, that that means that you know we don't expect seismic activity in the area. Um, uh, I guess beyond what has already uh, been built into the design aspects of the tailings dam and uh, the requirements for safety factors in in, in other parts of the um, say the, the codes for the uh, foundations that we use for the site specifications. The, the second part might be about um, mining induced seismic activity. Um, we, I guess, are aware that that is, is a possibility. It has happened. Um, and that's one of the risks that we are working, that we've identified and we're working to mitigate. So it's not something that we can avoid, but we can certainly minimize and be prepared for. So we are uh, preparing for some, um, I guess, the levels to be determined. The next question is from Rob Piccolo. What would you classify the underground ore type to be? Supergene, mesogene, or hypergene ore? Yeah, I get this question and I um you know I, I don't know it well enough. It's it's um 
I, I know we use those classifications at New Afton, but I'm afraid I can't answer the question. I don't know it well enough, and we're not using the same terminology as we did um, at, at, at New Afton. But our geologists and geology team would be disappointed in me, but um, and they would probably know the answer off the top of their head. I just do not. All right. There is a follow-up question from Matthew Brown. Will hydro fracking be deployed? Other industry leading edge, leading edge plans? A good question. And um, yeah, using um, preconditioning and, and using hydro fracturing um, equipment to do that is part of how we do cave mining safely. So yeah, we, we will be using preconditioning, which is the use of high pressure water through drill holes to pre-fracture the rock. Uh, that allows us to make sure, obviously, that the the, the cave progresses in a measured way, also reduces the, the maximum size that uh, reports to the draw points. So we're dealing with less hangups um, and primarily, you know, reduces the overall risk of air blast. So yeah, it's a risk management tool we will be using. Other industry leading edge, bleeding edge plans. Hey, um, you know, yeah, I, I mentioned the, um, the page on our investor um, section of our website. There is an innovation map there um, that, that shows a grid of, of those activities and, and um, innovative approaches that we're adopting. Um, and if you take a look at the progression from one, I think they call them briefing packs, one briefing pack to the next, you could see the progression of those particular initiatives as they, per, as they transition from TR lo, low TRL levels to higher TRL levels and progress from um, different colors of, of, of being considered for implementation at different locations. So yeah, single pass cave establishment is being considered. Um, obviously the electrification um, battery technology, we're following very closely and, and uh, that's, that's part of our feasibility study. Um, and there are other things in the works um, that are bleeding edge that I can't tell you about. So um, there's, there's some in each of those categories, but the investor packs are a very good way to, to see those um, and what Newcrest is progressing with. Another follow-up question from Matthew Brown. Any automation plans? Yeah, we have. Um, automation is, is part of what we're preparing for. So whether it's automation in the process plant um, and, and the way that we manage, you know, the flotation characteristics um, and the movement of materials around that plant, um, or if you're looking at uh, uh, the conveyor system from underground and the crusher itself, um, that will be most likely automated. Um, we're not going to have a crusher operator there with a hook looking to pull out uh, trash. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at an automated system and large scale um, materials handling systems. That transitions down into the underground and you know the use of loaders um, on the footprint. And right now we are uh, preparing to be automation ready um, and we're looking for the next generation of automation um, um, tools or automation, uh, uh, I guess, systems to support us in that. Uh, I was there when we automated North Parks and led that process. Um, with the, uh, the the loaders that were available at that time, I'm looking forward to the next generation. So, what uh, like TRL level would you consider um, for the project? Yeah, so I guess technology readiness level is is the TRL level um, I'm referring to. It's used in a lot of industries, NASA and, and, and others, everyone names NASA for some reason, but it's also used in automotive and, and different manufacturing facilities and a lot of less, um, I guess, cutting edge areas. The, the TRL level we target is eight. Um, and you know we're not uh, uh, saying that we don't consider or, or bring things along that are lower than that, but before we would include them in a study, it would be eight or higher. Hi, Eric. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I was noticing in your presentation that you were going to utilize um, El Teniente layouts in, in your design. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's correct. And um, you uh, summarized that from the layout that we showed, yeah? Yeah, Matt, my question is related to that. I was uh, wanted to ask you well, what were the decisive factors for going to El Teniente layout as opposed to Herringbone? Uh, the size of the pillars and the ability to keep them intact. You know, we're, um, we're about large drives and um, we need sizable pillars to maintain the stability of the level. We're, um, you know, I guess the Herringbone provides uh, automa well, automation advantages and, and operational advantages, um, yeah. but it's, it's more difficult to maintain those uh, uh, pillars in construction. Um, mm -hmm. And also, uh, the, the, I guess the design size is larger with El Tenientes and they're easier to, to, to cut or easier to drill and blast uh, and remain intact. Okay, thank you. If there's any more questions. Okay, let me uh, all right, let me uh, go to my presentation if you don't mind. Of course, uh, yeah. First Thanks of all, I want to uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, that this, as, as mentioned, this is my first to chair uh, and thank you for your patience and uh, I want to acknowledge the donors uh, and thank you very much there are a few people have uh, donated uh, um, uh, and uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if I can um, tell their names but I, I will certainly reach out to them separately via email and thank you for uh, supporting our our branch as you as you can see from the presentation uh, we uh, we used donations for furthering the knowledge of uh, Canadian mining uh, uh, through our through our branch events and sponsorships and scholarships. And as you can see, that um, I've shown uh, one of the letters that we have received uh, that the money that we have donated for the uh, teachers uh, uh, teachers tour. And uh, we also do um, um, scholarships for the, um, for the for the students in the geology and mining, as well as uh, touring museums as well. So all the money that that is donated to us, thank you very much. Keep them coming, and uh, that's uh, one uh, message I would like to leave you guys with. And also, I wanted to make sure that um, you know that we have uh, other sponsorship opportunities as well such as with the sponsoring the event such as this sponsorship as well as golf tournaments yeah, and uh, do reach back to us and uh, we'll be happy to uh, discuss that and uh, lastly uh, it's very fitting that uh, Eric mentioned about the uh, green uh, metal uh, we actually have a, a theme going for our branch uh, geared towards uh, um, green metals and uh, that's uh, of course, uh, some of the uh, events that's coming uh, next month, we'll have uh, Mike Mayu, uh, who is in, a, in who is in an impeccable position to give you an insights from both uh, manufacturer or B, you know, OEM as well as uh, end users' uh, point of view, as well as a consultant. And uh, in April, we'll we'll have Alan Kutz, who will return to us uh, to provide an update on. Uh, on uh, Norant, and uh, uh, hopefully this will not be the last one. But of course, uh, Norant is also in chromium and um, chromium and nickel, uh, which is a BE metal as well. And uh, also we'll have uh, Steve Lines coming back to us for uh, for an update for first mining gold. We'll see if we can have the our, our golf tournament as well. We are very hopeful that will that will happen. Uh, so stay tuned. And thank you very much for uh, everyone for uh, attending. Uh, we really appreciate I, I, it. I'd like to extend a special thanks to Ronnie Jones or Ronnie Jones. Um, she's on the call here and is instrumental in putting this together um, and, uh, and, and doing it in very timely fashion.
Thank you. Thank, thank you very much as well. And um, we still have some time if if you have any if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, uh, we can uh, we can leave now. Thanks, Eric. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good presentation. Thank you very much. Well, there, I'll, I'll sign off at this point. Doesn't look like there's going to be anything last minute. So thanks for go. having us. And um, yeah, appreciate your help in uh, making sure we got this going, kept it going. Excellent. So, Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. I'll Enjoy sign the off rest. Now. Thanks. Bye bye.